Today, on This Old Tony, Springs. Springs are elastic devices that store mechanical energy. Once deformed, they return to their former shape when released. Springs are typically used to exert or maintain a force or to absorb movement. They're available in all shapes and sizes, except the one you need. Developed in the 1500s by the sea monks of Denmark, springs were originally created to fill the gap between winters and summers. Today, springs are really bouncing back. Making springs at home is nothing to get bent out of shape about. Homemade springs don't have to be a wind-up. Most coiled metal springs start their lives off as metal. It all begins with a machine that carefully selects the proper wire size. The wire is clamped to a sturdy tool, referred to in the industry as that round metal thing. Why this genius didn't purchase a commercially available spring is a closely guarded trade secret. Generally speaking, there are two important steps to successfully making a spring, design and manufacture. Skipping step one may result in a spring that performs poorly or fails altogether. Skipping step two likely results in no spring at all. But let's not lose focus. After all, designing an airplane probably isn't easy, but it all depends on the final application, doesn't it? Let's take a quick and simplified look at what we usually ask springs to do. First, it needs to fit. Overall dimensions are probably the first thing you know. Second, it needs to provide the correct force and amount of travel for the job it's intended to do. And finally, Stress levels in the spring must be kept low enough for the material to handle the load and the cycles we expect. Not much of a spring if it fails the second time you use it, is it? However, if your masochistic tendencies run deep and you'd like to design your own spring, the handbook is a good place to start. It's basic, but it'll get you a properly functioning spring. If your spring is complicated, or you're interested in things like how many cycles it's good for, you'll need to resort to some math. that or turn to specialized software. UTS's advanced spring design is a good one, but it'll set you back a few dollars. However, all hope is not lost. Here's what you do. Cheat. Have a look at commercially available springs. Check places like McMaster Car or any of a host of spring manufacturers online. You'll find large catalogs of springs that have already been designed to work, assuming you use them the way that they're intended. If you find your spring, great. Buy it. Just kidding. If you're making a spring, you probably have a good reason. Look closely at all the data available. Spring size, wire diameter, pitch, material type, etc. And build yours as close to that as possible. Let's say, for example, you're building a better mousetrap. You're unlikely to find a commercially available spring, but try to break it down into parts. Look for commercial springs that are close and build your basic spring from there. Won't be perfect, but certainly better than a stick in the eye. Time to get this show on the road. So you have your spring dimensions. Wonderful. You'll now need some music wire. Music wire is cold drawn, heat treated wire. You might find it at your local hardware store, online, or your neighbor's piano. Like me, music wire can move pretty fast and pack quite the punch. Gloves and eye protection are probably a good idea. Finally, you'll need a mandrel to form your spring over. To recap, drawing, wire, mandrel, you're now Bob's nephew. The size and shape of the mandrel depend on the spring you're making. The mandrel is undersized to account for the spring back in the wire after forming. The amount of spring back depends on the diameter you're winding to, the diameter of the wire, and the material of the wire itself. Mandrels for a range of spring sizes and wire diameters can be found in the handbook. Note that this is for music wire. If you're using spicy bronze, your results will differ. Also, Marv Klotz wrote a handy program that calculates mandrel size. It is available for free. www.myvirtualnetwork.com slash mklotz. I have found it to be quite accurate. Thank you, Marv. The mandrel will also require a wire retention feature. A through hole works fine for compression and extension springs, but you'll need a screw or some way to clamp the wire for torsion springs. 
If this were a torsion spring, you'd have quite the time getting it off the mandrel. Begin by selecting or making the mandrel you need. Unless you need to duck every time it comes around, mandrel run out is usually not important. To get consistent results from your combination of wire diameter and mandrel, you'll want to keep the wire tension as constant as possible during winding. In practice, this is more important on larger wire diameters on smaller mandrels. There are likely a number of ways to do this. First, you could simply hold the wire with pliers, maintaining a constant tension during the winding process. A safer alternative might be to feed your wire through an empty tool holder, using a small piece of plastic or soft material to act as a brake. Adjust the clamping screws to achieve the pressure, and therefore the wire tension, that works best. If you're a bit touched like I am, you may want to make a dedicated tool. This holder, using a small piece of brass as a brake shoe and a replaceable MIG nozzle, offers the discerning spring maker the surgical precision they might not even need. Set your lathe to its lowest speed and to the pitch of spring you'd like to wind. Ensure your lathe will move the way you expect it to, making sure spindle and feed directions are correct. It's now time to make the donuts. Start by making the first few wraps manually. Move the carriage to keep up with the coils, letting the coils lead a bit to ensure they stay nice and closed. These are referred to as inactive coils. When happy, engage the half nuts and start the lathe. Stop the lathe and disengage the half nuts. As before, wrap a few more inactive coils manually. Be sure to use caution when cutting the spring free. Check the length of the spring and make sure you have the desired number of active coils. Active coils do all the work. Half of a turn more or less than what you designed may have a big impact on performance. Trim the ends. A V-block and belt grinder make quick work of squaring the spring. Torsion and extension springs are wound the same way. With some patience and a bit more care than being demonstrated, you can make quite the handsome springs at home. Springs change shape as they're loaded and unloaded. For example, a compression spring will expand and a torsion spring might contract. Keep this in mind if you plan to install them in pockets or on arbors. Finally, be sure to pay attention to the handedness of your springs. Springs used on bolts or threaded rod should have the opposite wrap direction to keep them from binding. The same goes for nested springs. Well, that's all for today. Although there are more subtleties in the design and manufacture of springs, you're now well on your way to shooting your eye out. As always, thank you for watching.